Aloha everyone and welcome to the third and final installment of our webinar series. It is just our third and final installment for 2020. We will be back in 2021 for the PTC webinar series, Frictionless Business. So keep us on your radar for next year. However, most importantly, what you should put on your radar for early next year in January is PTC 21 New Realities, January 17th to 20th, 2021. Visit our website, ptc.org slash PTC 21 to get all the information you need to register, sponsor, advertise, exhibit, or host a networking lounge. So before we get started with today's webinar, we want to play for you a brief video on frictionless business. PTC's new webinar series is all about frictionless business. Think of business friction as anything that can prevent a potential customer from selecting and buying your product or service. Frictionless business is about removing obstacles to success. That starts with ways to discover what problems your customers may have and how you can solve those problems for them. Create the right solutions, sell and market effectively, learn what new products you can develop, and provide your customer with outstanding support so the experience is seamless and business frictionless. It includes developing your human, technology, supply chain, and financial systems, corporate governance, market surveillance, and compliance operations. Frictionless businesses achieve superior results with less resource intensity. New thoughts, best practices, and experiences from global executives tap into the growth of frictionless business. A few housekeeping items for today's webinar. You are welcome to ask the panelists questions at any time. So please use the Q&A function within your Zoom platform to do so. And without further ado, I now turn it over to Jonathan Atkin, Managing Director of RBC Capital Markets. John? Thanks very much, Nicole. Um, welcome to the uh, third webinar. Um, topic is global finance and investment perspectives. We've got uh, quite a dream team here of uh, investment professionals. I want to thank everybody uh, in particular who may be listening from Europe where it's in the middle of the night. Um, those on the East Coast of the U.S. where it's already, uh, you know, well past working hours. Um, here in Hawaii, it's mid-afternoon, and then a lot of Asians may be dialed in live. Um, so our, with us on the panel are uh, Beth Hoffman from Berkshire Partners, Jan Vaselli from EQT, Jazz Kyra from Blackstone, and Waldemar Slezak from KKR. Um, and what I would like to do is ask each of them to provide a brief self-introduction, a um, couple minutes, your role, your company, the current and past portfolio investments that you have uh, related to digital infrastructure. And uh, why don't we kick it off uh, with you, Beth, and then, um, and then we'll pass it on to Jan, Jazz, and then, uh, and then Walter Marr. Welcome. Great, great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Beth Hoffman. I am a managing director at Berkshire Partners, uh, which is a Boston-based private equity fund. Uh, I've been with Berkshire Partners since 2003, and substantially all of that time has been focused around our communications and technology infrastructure investing uh, area. Um, over that period of time, Berkshire's invested, I guess, for 25 years plus uh, in telecom and digital infrastructure. Uh, we were initial investors in a business we all know today as Crown Castle. Uh, we've also invested in the tower space and tower development corporation, uh, which was a partnership with Crown Castle uh, here domestically in the United States and in Puerto Rico. Uh, we were investors in Torres Unidas, which was a, actually a startup company in the Andean region uh, of South America. Uh, which we uh, sold to ATP, and we're current investors in Protolindo, which is uh, the largest tower company in Indonesia. Uh, on the data center front, uh, we were investors in Telex, uh, and we are current investors in Terraco in South Africa. And on the fiber side, we were investors uh, for a long time uh, in Light Tower uh, and helping them through a lot of consolidation moves in M&A uh, before selling that business uh, to Crown Castle here a couple of years ago. Uh, we're also currently investors in Vapor.io, which is um, a player on the edge uh, in terms of mobile edge computing. And we're investors in Macergy, who's a provider of managed network services and SD-WAN services to enterprises. So that's it. Excellent. Um, over to you, Jan. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Wesley. I'm a partner at EQT uh, based in New York. I'm responsible uh, for our digital infrastructure investments out of the infrastructure fund. Uh, EQT is a Sweden-based private equity firm, uh, one of the largest European firms, um, especially our, our, our infrastructure business line. Uh, has been focusing on digital infrastructure um, heavily over the last couple of years, but we have a 25, his, 25 year history in investing in the digital infrastructure space, starting with cable in the 90s through our private equity funds, primarily focusing um, on Europe at the time. Uh, overall, EQT has uh, raised some 62 billion euro uh, in capital. Uh, the current infrastructure fund is a uh, $10 billion roughly fund, um, more than half of which is invested actually in digital infrastructure. Uh, I'm personally involved in uh, several companies in the US, um, um, namely Zeo, uh, which everybody knows uh, probably, um, Segra uh, based in uh, North Carolina. And most recently, um, Edge Connects on the on the data center side, which which focuses on uh, hyperscale cloud data centers as well as edge data centers. Other than these three, we have uh, a number of additional investments in the digital infrastructure space uh, in Europe. Um, the uh, the most relevant ones are Global Connect, uh, which is a Scandinavian uh, fiber company, um, as well uh, fo focusing on all uh, three Scandinavian markets um, and building fiber to the home in, in, in Sweden. Uh, Delta Fiber, fiber to the home business based in the Netherlands, uh, focusing on uh, more rural uh, areas in the Netherlands, uh, as well as Inexio and Deutsche Glasfaser in Germany. Uh, the last of which we bought from uh, KKR, who's also from Valdemar on this call. <laughs> Um, uh, otherwise, we also own Melita, which is a kind of all around telco business um, uh, based in uh, Malta, uh, a small island in the Med Mediterranean. Um, so clearly, uh, digital infrastructure is a major focus of ours. Excellent. Uh, Jazz, over to you. Welcome. Aloha, everyone. Uh, my name is Jazz, as John mentioned. I'm a partner at Blackstone, uh, and I've been at Blackstone for almost 17 years now. I co-lead our tactical opportunities group uh, out of North America, out of New York. And tactical opportunities is Blackstone's most flexible investing platform. And we manage about 30 billion of capital. Uh, as, as Beth mentioned, you know, we've also been investors in, in telecom and cable infrastructure for a very long time. Uh, but in the past five years or so, uh, TACOPS has invested about 3 billion of equity uh, in digital infrastructure specifically, focused on towers, data centers, and, and fiber. Uh, we've invested in a, in a towers platform, our global towers platform called Phoenix Tower. Uh, we have a, a tower business in Brazil called T4U. Uh, we've made investments in data centers, including Ashenti, uh, which was previously as an investment in Brazil and, and subsequently sold to Brookfield and Digital Realty. Uh, we have a French fiber platform focused on dark fiber in Paris called Sipartec. Uh, and we've made a number of investments across build to suit PowerShell uh, data center businesses uh, across uh, Asia. Great. And uh, Waldemar, why don't you uh, round it out? It's pretty hard to follow this group. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be brief. Waldemar Slezak, Managing Director of KKR, spent most of my time on digital infrastructure telecom. As, as most of you know, KKR is a global firm, manages about $230 billion of assets under management across different strategies, focusing on different uh, different sort of type of opportunities. I spend most of my time for, focusing on infrastructure, which is a $25 billion business today. Um, in infrastructure, we've been, as everyone here, quite active in telecom infrastructure, particularly uh, some of the portfolio companies uh, we have or have had including Deutsche Glasfaser, which, which is now in the hands of, of, of Jan and his team. But uh, Telsius, uh, which is a, a, a tower and a subsea cable business across Europe and South America. Hivery, which is a, a, a tower company and a small cell operator in France. Uh, Hyperoptic fiber to the premise business in, in the UK. And uh, Global Technical Realty, which is actually a built to suit data center platform across Europe. And we have two recent investments, which we uh, which we announced uh, just this recently. One of them is Fibercope, which is a partnership with Telecom Italia to carve out the secondary network uh, in, in Italy, and a startup Powerco in, in in Asia, 
Pinnacle Towers, which we just launched, uh, focusing on the Filipino market. Excellent. So a good a good mix of asset classes, a, a broad range of geography, weighted, I suppose, a little bit towards the Western Hemisphere and Europe, with a little bit of Asia, depending on uh, 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 you know the individual. But let me let me just kind of kick off with a, with a macro question, and um, starting off with uh, with Jazz, how you, how you think about investing in the current macro environment uh, with COVID. Um, investing now versus waiting to see what the new normal looks like? I think, you know, very humbly uh, for ourselves, it, it, the short answer would be very carefully. Uh, the interest rates having come down the way they have has, has really propelled valuations for most of the asset classes that my colleagues on the phone and I uh, invest in. Uh, and that's, that's certainly made it more challenging to find the return profiles that we're looking for. Um, I think when you mentioned, John, the return to the new normal, I, I'm not sure when it comes to valuations, uh, there will be a new normal for us in many of the spaces we look at. Uh, a lot of that, I think, is driven by the fact that there's been a significant increase in sort of perpetual infrastructure capital as a new asset class to go after a number of these deals and sectors that we've been talking about. Uh, and they simply can't be investing in hydrocarbons at the same pace that they have. And so to some extent, I think that's pushed out the demand curve and the capital markets demand and desire for these same businesses. Um, so I think that that is going to stay as a longer term trend and theme uh, in terms of where we've been thinking about investing, given that macro environment. Uh, it's been trying to find deals that are, are are growing still within that, and that we can take a different point of view on a growth rate that might otherwise seem, uh, you know, very fast or difficult, but getting conviction in that in order to navigate the current environment. So, Beth, same question, uh, different answer. Um, I, I mean, I think yes, did a great job sort of addressing the valuation environment, which has clearly gone up. I, I think, you know, across Berkshire invests in a wide range of sectors, of which Com is one. And I think of all the sectors, um, telecommunications and digital infrastructure has been uh, amazingly resilient through COVID. So when we think about a return to normal from in terms of an industry and business operations perspective, if anything, it's a sector where COVID has highlighted uh, the dependence and interdependence around our telecommunications networks um, and just how important they are to how people do business and how individuals communicate. And so, you know, unlike on other sectors, you know, I, I think, you know, it, it's held on strong. It's reminded, I'm sure, all of us why we like recurring revenue business models um, and just the sheer importance of networking. We've actually seen some acceleration in certain parts of the market as trends get pulled forward. Uh, people seek to invest in to accommodate sort of this new normal uh, that people are, are having to invest in. So we haven't really, you know, valuations have gone up, but, you know, in our other sectors at Berkshire, people sort of say, you know, is there an opportunity while things are down um, to sort of be opportunistic and, and within telecom and digital infrastructure, you know, that, that sort of pothole or hiccup just really hasn't happened. Uh, and so we continue to sort of think about where the trends are going to be three to five years from now, but um, for better or worse, other than how we work and interact with ourselves and you know how we're able to think about interacting with management teams we might be able to partner with or go to visit their operations um, that's been more of the practical challenge but uh, it hasn't from a business and industry standpoint uh, we're not really waiting because I don't think the industry has really slowed down. Um, Jan why don't you uh, provide your perspective as well? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, most points have been made. What I would uh, maybe add is that, of course, you know, with a lot of portfolio companies in this space, uh, we see across a fairly wide, you know, array of, of different uh, digital infrastructure businesses across fiber, uh, B2B residential uh, data centers, you know, uh, what the implications of COVID are on these businesses. And, you know, in terms of portfolio composition compare, you know, uh, we're in a very lucky position that that the majority of the fund is is in the digital infra space. We haven't seen any material impact on any of the businesses. Uh, in fact, some several have you know accelerated, especially the ones that kind of uh, have cloud exposure or benefit from uh, you know residential broadband needs. Lots of people upgrading uh, their bandwidth. So you know, long term, um, short term, there have been very limited impact. You know, uh, as Beth said, that that's the beauty of recurring revenue streams uh, and uh, generally broadband uh, having become a utility service. Basically, um, long term, I think this will. I expect this to be very positive. You know, for for this industry, it's forcing 
every business basically to rethink their their approach to their IT, um, and they will have to you know modernize their whole business model uh, and be much more digital, uh, which all will require a lot more digital infrastructure. So, um, you know, we are careful, but I think you know we're clearly not slowing down. We've made a new investment during COVID uh, in Edge Connects, um, signed in August and closed last week, um, and we've seen actually the growth accelerate in the business throughout COVID. Um, so one has to be careful, but I, I remain fairly optimistic on this sector. So we do have um, opportunity for audience questions. If you use uh, the Q&A feature and type in your question, we'll be able to identify it in time permitting. We'll be able to call on you. Um, so I guess, um, you know, ju jumping ahead a little bit, um, 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 a question around, um, you know, your return expectations um, and how they may have evolved over the time over time for, for, for fiber, for um, towers and mobile infrastructure, for data centers. So the question basically starting with Walter Moore, I'd like to hit, uh, ask you uh, initially is when you're underwriting a data center, tower and fiber investment, you've got experience with all three asset classes. How have return thresholds evolved for you over the past couple of years and recently, how have your views changed because of the current market backdrop? Well, I think it would be foolish to say that return expectations have, have definitely come down. The cost of capital has come down, I think, across the sectors. I would say towers have probably been more most significantly impacted, but given, I think, you know, I mean, Bath mentioned their investment in Crown Castle and the growth rates in the early 2000s and what we saw through the Tower Core Exponent platforms. I think it's hard to replicate it in today's environment. And when deals are happening 30 plus times tower cash flow multiples, with a, a single digit growth, you know, I think anyone who's expecting anything over double digit returns is, is probably, you know, maybe kidding themselves in aggregate. That's, that's, that's will be my perspective, at least in that sector. Uh, but I think that there's definitely pockets of opportunities. I wouldn't say that it's just universal. I think there's different geographies, different business models. I think some of us have taken the approach of actually building businesses and taking and doing that, 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 you know, very, that's a, that's a difficult endeavor, uh, especially for, for private equity funds. Uh, and especially for funds who look to invest, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. I think the general trend has been down. And I think, uh, you know, all the panelists have identified the issues earlier, which is, I think the rotation out of, uh, out of some of the other more macro impacted sectors to telecom has only increased valuations and probably lowered the thresholds uh, even more. I, I actually, I think as bullish as I am on the sector overall, I don't think that that it's going to universally work out for everyone. That's my, you know, bucket of cold water. Okay, Jazz. Yeah, no, it's it's and tough to add. It's tough to add to that. I'd, I'd say the um, when we started this, you know, several of us on the panel, 15, 17, 18 years ago, this was private equity. This is not infrastructure. This is called private equity, and we were all shooting for 20% plus returns, and and they've sort of dropped. And there's you know 15% opportunistic core funds and and now infrastructure funds, and I think what we see now in in certain subsegments in data centers, for example, some of the build a suit deals that Waldemar was talking about, you know even core real estate funds with an even lower cost of capital or our LPs directly participating in some of these deals at an even lower cost of capital. So. Uh, I think there's an unquestioned trend towards that across the space. And to generate higher returns, you have to be a builder. You can't be a yielder. And that's that's part of that dynamic, uh, as you mentioned. So not much more than that, Dad. Jan. So question on you know each of the asset classes and uh, you know return return thresholds, how that's evolved over time. Uh, well, I think everything has been has been said. Uh, you know, uh, clearly uh, valuations have gone up and returns. Um, you know, uh, expectations are are, are going down. Um, generally, uh, we do continue to think there are good opportunities. I think one has to be you know a little bit ahead of the curve um, if one wants to get to a really good return. Um, um, and uh, you know, um, redefine a little bit where you know where infrastructure is and, and what the risk profile is of the different assets uh so we're you know trying to trying to do trying to stay a step ahead uh, but i totally agree i mean we make our returns uh you know by being heavily operationally involved growing the businesses 
uh, we work with uh, you know consolidating markets uh, so it's a you know very much hands-on approach uh, one has to really understand the assets I do agree with Valdemar that you know there will be mistakes made as everybody knows integrations can be very difficult in this industry uh, you know doing it wrong uh, can cause a lot of issues for people but I think everything has been said so two, two uh, I guess three kind of business models that weren't mentioned um, other than indirectly by by Beth uh, because of their investment in Masergy. But um, you know we've gotten uh, some questions come in already on subsea cable infrastructure, satellites, and then uh, I want to ask also about managed network services. Um, um, and does that fit so for the, for the other three of you, not Beth? Does that do these fit within your definitions of infrastructure? What do you see as the pros and cons? Um, and does it even fulfill your, your mandate to go into satellite, subsea, uh, managed network services? Why don't I ask um, um, Waldemar first, then uh, Jazz, and then, and then Jan? Right, put me on the spot, why not? Uh, we tend to have a, a relatively, I would call, pure definition of infrastructure. I think for us, we, we've been very focused on that, and we, we really don't deviate very much from, from that definition. So I think some of the business models, if they are attached to a fundamental, what we view it as an infrastructure business, uh, I think we're, we're okay tolerating them. But I think if they're standalone a managed services business, that likely doesn't fit. It's probably for us would be a more private equity risk. And then the question really is, you know, can you can you invest in the business to generate private equity returns? And I think those have come down as well. Those are not 20 plus, those, those are probably 17 and a half or whatever it may be, you know, these days. So, so uh, you know, I think that we, as, as everyone, I think, try to be thematic and be a step ahead, uh, but we're very careful in pushing the envelope in, in terms of uh, at least this pool of capital, because we feel we owe our investors, the stewards of that, their capital, is preservation of capital is, is primary objective. Yes. I think we, we have the benefit of being very opportunistic and being able to look at many of those assets. Um, I think that benefit comes with a curse as well in, in terms of spending a lot of time and realizing some of those business models uh, just don't have those same characteristics that Beth was talking about in terms of being resilient during times like this. And so subsea cable, we spend a lot of time on it. I think we, we, we feel like the economic model in many cases is challenging. Um, it, the business has become more commoditized with hyperscalers going direct, doing their own routes. And, and frankly, it's almost become a general contractor business where if you wanted to be disruptive, you would lay your own cable, make a 5% GC margin and, and kind of move on. In terms of managed services, you know, I think what we found is in certain markets, and actually Waldemar's firm did a really nice deal in Europe uh, called OVH that we think is pretty terrific. You've, you've got moats around managed services because of geography, uh, government regulation, challenges like that. You see it in, in some markets in Latin America as well. But with the exception of that, I think we we struggle with the overall churn and the long-term trends and that being able to support an exit multiple. So while there may be cash flow, it's just how does one see this and exit from this five years onwards and so on. Um, and then satellites are interesting. I think we, we've spent uh, a lot of time looking at various different satellite plays and are humbled uh, by the amount of capital currently right now being put into satellites. And if there is, to Waldemar's point, if there's one cautionary tale is when everyone's throwing capital at somebody, you've got the tragedy of the commons. And unfortunately, the return on capital is going to sort of probably fall precipitously. So uh, we've, we've stayed away on the view that it's going to be tough to beat Mr. Musk and Mr. Bezos at that game. Um, Jan, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, you know, what's infrastructure is fairly clearly defined uh, by a couple of uh, specific, uh, you know, um, requirements. You know, it has to, in our view, provide an essential service. Uh, it should be, you know, it needs to be a very defensible business. Uh, it doesn't have technology risk. Um, um, and, you know, those, those are... We don't move away from those uh, when we make new investment decisions. So I think several of the, you know, the things that you listed are basically ruled out um, by these uh, factors. You know, uh, subsea fiber was clearly mentioned that it's very commoditized unless you have some kind of unique routes. Um, and the, you know, the hyperscalers, the cloud companies, it's just too essential to them, and and, and it's too cheap to build for them, <laughs> or they have too much money, whichever way you want to look on it uh, at it. So, you know, the capacity is just being uh, growing dramatically. Satellites, uh, you know, I conceive have to have a lot of technology risk at the moment. Um, it may 
change going uh, you know once uh, uh, once Leo satellites are built and they work and the antennas work and maybe that's different but right now uh, I think it's a bit of a, a stretch um, and geo obviously satellites you know with the potential of being disrupted by Leo satellites are also difficult uh, at the moment in, in, in our view at least and in in terms of managed services I completely agree there with uh, Valdemar I mean that's that's uh, not an infrastructure unless it's tied to an infrastructure uh, and an additional service you're selling based on assets based on another relationship with the customer uh, we don't think that's a standalone infrastructure investment so I want to drill down a little bit on data centers um, a lot of ways to invest a lot of you kind of have embodied that in companies that you either have owned or currently are involved in mm -hmm from hyperscale, wholesale, retail, um, edge opportunities. And I think I want to ask each of you to kind of opine on this, starting with Beth. Given your um, involvement with, with both Terraco and, uh, and Vapor.io, uh, so two, two different flavors of data center investment, how do you um, sort of view the different, um, the different models uh, from a return profile and uh, uh, ways in which you think uh, can add the most uh, value? Um, I mean, the, the data center space is pretty broad, and so we think about the different segments within that very, very differently. Uh, the hyperscale and wholesale space to us, to us, it's all about cost to build and cost of capital. Um, you, you really have to build cheaply, and scale matters, and getting to a lower cost of capital is very important. Uh, we think a lot about in that space what happens upon renewal of those contracts, and there, is there a reason for the customers who are large powerful customers in many cases, uh, what are they gonna do when that contract comes up and what's gonna keep them there? I think you know different hyperscale or wholesale assets, there are different characteristics where you could argue that you, that's more sticky. Uh, and that's, I think more interesting and offers you know a chance for higher uh, returns and more durability to the model. Um, but th that clearly to us is, is much more around a, a cost of capital game than Microsoft, Facebooks, et cetera. While they too have a low cost of capital, they're looking for other ways to effectively get off balance sheet financing, um, unless it's tied to a campus that's highly interconnected. You know, when we invested in Telex uh, way back in 2012, and I recall everybody was shocked, we paid all of 12 times and they thought that was eye poppingly high. Um, we, we really liked that business because of, you know, 70% plus of its customers were networks and service providers that were really interconnecting at one strategic location. It was known by its address, not by even its city. And that was very sticky business and people had to be there and you could charge higher rents to be there. Um, and so that business to us, uh, we thought we paid a premium at the time. We clearly sold it to Digital Realty too early, um, uh, looking at where multiples have gone. Um, but I think the stickiness and resiliency of that model is one of the ones that led us to Terraco in South Africa, because I think we see that as a little bit of telex of, of South Africa in terms of Sub-Saharan Africa and where uh, various providers are going to need to connect. Um, Terco happens to have both the interconnected data center. It does offer some retail and some hyperscale, um, but it really has some unique assets there. Um, for us, I, I think one of, you know, retail for us is tricky. Um, right now, uh, the customer base has largely, people have begun to segment their workload segment where they put things. They're trying to either optimize performance or reduce cost, and, and that's left the retail uh, market uh, a little bit uh, in trouble. Um, so it's not an area that we candidly have spent a lot of time on of late. And then, and the, you know, the managed services space, it's, it's been interesting to watch the cycle. It's been a good name to then be a bad name, good. You know, it, managed services, my answer on that is it all depends. That's capturing a very large uh, sort of pot of soup in terms of what those are. Uh, a lot of people claim to have them. Some of them really are more human capital based and some of them are more repeatable technology platform based uh, in terms of what they're offering. And I think those offer very, very different risk profiles and very, very different paths to scale. One is a lot more easy to scale and repeatable uh, than the other. And so it's, they're, they're all very, very uh, different to us. I think in terms of core infrastructure, the hyperscale and the cost of capital, I think that's a you know, for traditional private equity funds, you know, you, you can't compete with private equity cost of capital in that market very effectively unless you have a different vision. Um, so, Jan, you, you, um, you know, through EdgeConnects, I guess, in one single company, it embodies, um, 
you know, both edge as well as hyperscale, depending on the city and the vintage of the asset. So what's kind of your take on, uh, you know, different ways to participate in the market and, and, and return expectations? Yeah, I mean, very similar to what Beth said, we are kind of not focused on, on uh, retail data centers. Uh, so obviously, connectivity based data centers are great. They're difficult to come by, <laughs> I'll say. Um, uh, I think, you know, Equinix's uh, business model is, is hard to beat, <laughs> I would say, generally. Um, what we do, you know, we are quite focused on, on uh, generally the overall everything that's growing with the cloud, with the hyperscalers, you know, be it on the, on the large deployments as well as the, the small deployments on the edge um, or in the, in the local markets. You know, we see both of those, uh, expect both of those to continue growing in by, you know, double digit percentage points over the next 10 years, uh, basically per, per year. So that's where we spend a lot of time. We actually consider those two to be fairly complementary um, in terms of, uh, you know, a big overlap in the customer base, but also kind of a convergence in what the, what customers want to do. Uh, you know, the large, very large deployments, whenever feasible, you know, will be done in-house, uh, most likely uh, by the cloud companies. Uh, and it's going to be the smaller deployments that they, they outsource in more, you know, in the local markets. Um, and uh, we think having both elements of that story is actually quite, quite useful because, uh, you know, you can provide... Uh, uh, first of all, a, a, a less lumpy, uh, less lumpy bookings, less lumpy growth, but also just as the as it transitions to more of the smaller sites being outsourced, you know, we think that's quite uh, um, complementary in terms of growth. I mean, we see um, so so Edge Connects obviously we see a big opportunity to to basically be a global provider for these global companies uh, and aim to build a global business model uh, basically today edge connects is already you know fairly international for its size uh, we will definitely help them uh, strength further strengthen their position in europe um, uh, but really also enter the asian market uh, and grow more in in south america you know what we hear is that the, the customers are really looking for reliable partners um, that's a huge business on, on the cloud uh, side that depends on, on the business. So, um, I do agree that obviously cost of capital are important, but with the quality of the, of the counterparties here, you know, the equity is actually a relatively small piece of any new build. So, you know, the returns actually can be fairly attractive on that. You know, it's a small equity piece, obviously, but it, it can be fairly attractive. Um, so we focus very much on, on organically growing the businesses. The, the, the initial investment, it's more, we look at it as an entry price to, to be able to participate in a high growth sector, you know, with very defensible business. Um, it is fairly hard to move for these companies uh, and, you know, after the contracts expire. Um, it's not impossible, but it is very hard while they're still growing, their underlying business is growing, you know, double digit. They're more concerned about uh, actually having enough power than, than necessarily moving lar uh, existing deployments. Um, so, Jeff, uh, th thank you for that. And then, um, okay, maybe just to round out some of these data center topics on uh, with Jazz um, and Waldemar, just given the global technical realty, you know, kind of startup uh, initiative. But, but with Jazz, you've got 21 Vianet in China. Um, you know, a lot of different focuses that they've had historically, maybe tell us a little bit about how you view that opportunity um, in the context of maybe your former uh, involvement with Ascenti. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, Ascenti very much represented the model, uh, and it's a little bit, it's different than Terraco in that it didn't have that unique IX that Terraco has in Joburg. So that's very powerful. So it, it, it was an interconnection dynamic, but it was very uniquely positioned as sort of the player of choice in a difficult market to build in. And so as a result, captured, you know, a, a very high share and, and, and was just in early days of that inflection towards hyperscale. And so I think that clued us on early that if you can get into that market early, having that trusted provider, as Jan mentioned, in those markets that are hard to build in will allow you to earn above market economics and earn extra economic rent uh, for the risk. And so we've been sort of on the hunt for that in, in other markets as well globally. Um, I will say in China, uh, our journey in China started two years ago, and we're very, very close to investing in another business. 
uh, that we candidly should have invested in. I think you know that business, John, uh, and, uh, and, and I think spent a lot of time around the Chinese market. Uh, it is the, the second largest market today for hypercent, not just hyperscale, but data center deployments. And it's growing much, much faster than the US. And we were convinced there needed to be a number two player. In fact, there needs to be a number two, three, and four player in China to GDS, uh, which has done a terrific job uh, building that out. And after spending a lot of time with the team at Toyman Binet, who had previously pursued some different strategies in cloud, VPN, and retail as well, uh, I think there's a strong focus to building out hyperscale, some early wins with Alibaba, and then continued momentum this year as they've leased out over 100 megawatts in, in four quarters. Uh, and I think that opportunity will continue to be there in China and, and grow. Um, I think our view on hyperscale in more mature markets like Western Europe, the flat markets, the US, um, I, I think we view this as, if you just sort of, sort of see the dirty little secret about most of these hyperscale deployments, 70% of it's Microsoft in those markets in terms of what is going to the data center players as opposed to what's being built on their own. And I think we continually will see more and more pressure for folks to just build on their own and own those assets in those core markets where they're gonna develop that expertise. I think what we're doing around that is looking to kind of get to the, the bottom line on it and basically do PowerShell and, and kind of disrupt that and, and just go direct, work with developers, on parcels where they've got a point of view on renewable energy sources that meet the latest specs and just go direct, do powered shell, admit that it's gonna be low return, but leverage the fact that you're gonna get very attractive financing on that. Um, Waldemar, I think you, um, at least on my screen, you may have disappeared. Oh no, there you are. So Waldemar, on the you know global technical realty, um, obviously a very experienced executive that you've invested in. This is, I think, it's at least his third data center venture um, in Europe with, with very you know, attractive exits. Um, well, how do you view the landscape there? There's quite a number of non-flat markets now where the hyperscale requirements are, are, are approaching or surpassing double digits. So what's the, um, what does the playing field look like? Um, and um, um, what, what can we expect from, um, from your investment there? Yeah, I, I'll just maybe I'll just chime in because I agree with everything that has been said about the sector. I think something that Jazz mentioned is particularly important. It's it's a very it's still a location specific uh, asset class, and that location matters and barriers to entry matter. And I think, you know, we can look at some of the U.S. markets. There are, there are really no barriers to entry. Like in North Virginia, you can buy land and you can get power. And so then it's a race to the bottom. I think there are markets still. What, which have significant barriers to entry. I think Jess mentioned some of the Latin American opportunities in Ascenti and Bat mentioned obviously South Africa. I think Asia has that. And I think Europe still has that because I think getting power, getting, getting land and actually building assets is really difficult. So that opportunity of in-source, outsource, it, it, I think that equation changes in our view towards that outsource. And then access to teams and products that I think are capable. I think there's definitely an evolution that needs to take place and continually evolving your cost per megawatt and driving that down. And I think you're going to see a lot more built to suit, you know, single asset campuses for, for, for tenants. And I think you're already seeing a little bit of that happening in North Virginia with what has happened with some of the moves from a colo to a, to a, to a dedicated facility. And I think the industry, this, this renewal question that always comes up and we wrestle with it as well. It, it's a really good question. I think it will, of course, depend on the asset and what the, what sort of how it's positioned. But I think there's two cases, at least over the past week, I've seen in North Virginia where a client walked out of a, a facility and moved across the street to a, to, a, to a brand new facility built for the, for the client. And you can look up the public companies that are affected by that. So I think that there will be actually opportunities. I predict there'll be some level of distress because that excess leverage and that point of view that a lot of people have taken on renewal, um, I think may come into question and you know, that may actually bode well. Tying it all back to GTR and into European markets. Uh, I, I mean, I think we view that Europe because of the complexity, because of some of the GDPR issues, because of the emergence of the secondary and tertiary markets, we still think that there is an incredible opportunity and there are, there are fewer platforms that are actually uh, focusing on a pet, on kind of a regional basis and a lot of uh, assets focusing on specific specific countries and, and so we, we're pretty bullish and i think you know anytime we have a chance to go and back someone uh with Fronix capabilities and we vetted the team 
that knows the markets pretty well, I think we'll, we'll get more than a fair shot uh, at, at doing something. But, but it's no question, there is a race to the bottom and economics are very, very competitive. And uh, oftentimes, you know, we're seeing competing directly with those customers for who, who want to go direct and build assets. So that evolution of a power shell is likely what ends up happening to Jess's point, to Jess's point in certain markets. Um, so I'd like to turn to mobile infrastructure, towers, um, small cells, and uh, um, starting off with uh, with Beth, and then um, and then and then Jazz, and then, and then you, Waldemar. Um, you know, you've you've invested to varying degrees across all major all major regions, but um, you know, philosophically, are are we thinking mobile? Uh, you know, macro towers is 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 the most attractive opportunity in the markets where you've invested in, or do you see small cells as a attractive add-on business or um, something that uh, is just fundamentally different uh, in terms of operational complexity and maybe um, fits under 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 a different rubric. So Beth, any any kind of views on that? given your experience with uh, um, across multiple regions. Right, I mean, I think I'd start by saying whether it's towers or DAS or small cells or you know, venue-based or indoor wireless or private LTE, I, I think they all have a place uh, as part of wireless infrastructure. Each of them serve a different purpose um, and are in the right choice in the right circumstances. You have everyone trying to figure out how to get the best performance to the right place at the lowest cost. And each of these technologies, I think, are going to be part of the tapestry that creates the wireless network and allows it to function, um, you know, in, in all places as consumers and businesses have come to expect. And so, you know, we we like uh, all of them. We're, we've never been at the camp that macro towers are going away. Um, they provide a really real role in coverage. Um, but now that we're seeing, you know, various companies, you know, there's more and more spectrum at different levels getting utilized and different technologies serve different purposes. And so, um, you know, we, we would never think a tower can cover an indoor venue particularly well, um, particularly if you're using higher spectrum. So, you know, I, I think we continue to look across all of them. Um, and when we see CBRS and other technologies coming forward, I think we're really going to see a world much more so with connectivity as a service. Um, and not all of that wireless connectivity, I don't think is gonna be delivered by the traditional MNOs that we've seen. I think we're gonna see that market and ecosystem evolve quite a bit. And I think, you know, one of the most interesting things for us is it used to be, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you could think about the wireline world, the wireless world and cloud. Well, cloud 20 years ago wasn't really there that much, but, but now they're all coming together in ways we haven't seen before. Um, cloud is going to be a big participant in telco. Um, you know, people have said cloud is coming for telco. Um, they, they want to participate, open RAN and, and other things and the logic going into the software and out of the hardware and physical assets is creating new and different models. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we internally look at it and say the landscape, the change we expect to see over the next 10 years is probably going to be greater than the change we've seen over the last 10 years. And, um, you know, to us, that's exciting. That creates investment opportunity with change comes opportunity. Um, but, you know, we continue to look at, at, at each of the technologies you mentioned um, and architectures and think that they'll all be a part of the platform. It's just, can you deploy them appropriately in the right places? Are there um, geographic, um, er, you know, areas, continents, countries uh, that you think are kind of most conducive? Part of that, I suppose, depends on uh, economic development as well as regulation. But, um, you know, given, given the Latin American exposure that you've had, um, Proto-Lindo, um, and 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 uh, obviously Crown Castle. Um, any general uh, thoughts on 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 regions that that particularly are target rich for mobile right. infrastructure? I mean, I think over time we've benefited from pattern recognition. Um, the United States and and Europe as well, in some ways, historically have been a half step ahead of other regions in the world. Um, so maybe a G ahead, uh, if not more. And so what happened? What we've seen in the U.S. and Europe, we can predict what's going to happen in other markets. It's not a perfect analogy. Um, and we often think about what's going to be the same and what's going to be different. Um, in some cases, we've seen certain markets skip a G um, as they think about you know, what exists there. And then we also pay a lot of attention to what sort of the what's the wireline footprint, how much cut you know co cable may or may not exist in some of these geographies. Um, and so I, you know I think we have a view that the world benefits from communications and communications infrastructure. It enables people and populations to do things and allows access in ways that heretofore, maybe haven't existed in those. So we think it's it's coming for nearly everywhere. 
when we think about what's appropriate or not, we really look at sort of the, the economy and the country risk that we see in a given country and what the carrier uh, or wireless landscape looks like there. Each country is a little different. We very consciously sat out of India, uh, sort of the first time people raced into that market because we just didn't believe that a market with, you know, that many carriers could exist for that long. Um, very few markets uh, have four or more carriers. In fact, few have three or more. Um, and, and so, you know, consolidation can be bad in some instances for shared infrastructure. So, but for us, it really, you know, country risk and, and sort of, you know, the good news is that communications is apolitical. Uh, everybody, everybody wants communications, but, you know, not all economies offer the same stability and all the growth you see. If you watch an economy go backwards or a currency devalue, you can erase a lot of growth very, very quickly. So Jazz and then and then Walter um, um, you know, given given your uh, activities at Soros as well, maybe you can fold in some perspectives. But Jazz, over to you then on on kind of the same question around mobile infrastructure. That was a near perfect answer by Beth. You're going to have to ask me a different question, John. Like I literally have nothing to add. To That's that. not true. <laughs> yeah. so John, ask me another question. Sorry, <laughs> we're going to Walter Baltimore. So Africa, you know, uh, with 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 Helios, uh, you've got experience in the U.S. with Towerco, and then uh, the Philippines, obviously being a recent um, area of interest, Southeast Asia. How do you kind of view um, the opportunity um, in mobile infrastructure? No, I do have to agree with Jazz. I think uh, it's refreshing to hear someone speak of of, of towers and 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 Daz the way that Bath was describing it. I think it's, it's, there's there's actually not a lot of people who do that, so it's great. Uh, but enough, enough said. Yeah, I mean, I think at Soros, we were adventurous enough where we've entered markets like Africa and, and really launched the first real, you know, Pan-African tower business, now a public company called Helios Towers. So, uh, you know, I think the ingredients that Beth alluded to, another shout out, is, is what we looked for in those markets. I think there are certain markets in, in Asia, for example, where we, where, we, where we looked at and we said it just doesn't, it's not going to work out. Uh, you know, I think some some of the challenges that India faced in terms of consolidation. I think too many players. I think rationalizing lack of barriers to entry. I think just didn't bode well to us for 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 a tower business model. But you know, I think elements of Africa did, and we viewed that there was significant barriers to entry. It was you know ten times more difficult to launch and build that business, and took twice as long as we expected, and probably cost one and a half times more money than we thought. But we finally got there and it's now a seven tower, 7,000 tower business, I think operates in five markets because they've actually entered and is becoming much more fully integrated, focusing on, on, on small cells as well, mostly in building and including, I think, fiber and data centers in, in Africa with, I think, their entry there as well. So I, I'm a big believer. I think it's very difficult to find all those ingredients uh, to make it for investment. I think particularly in the seat that I sit in really focusing on OECD markets, it really rules out most of the geographies. With that said, uh, we do have an Asia Pacific infrastructure fund. I think the Philippines opportunity is in our backyard. We've done quite a few investments in the market. We have people on the ground. We like what is happening in terms of uh, new entrants into the market, the government pushed to, uh, to you know, improve service quality. All of those ingredients that I think all of us saw early in the late 90s, early 2000s in the US and some of these other markets, and so we felt that I think if we can identify the right team and with the capabilities on the ground, we have a real shot of building a business and that's what we're endeavoring in doing. Um, I want to, uh, so we had a couple of questions come in around edge and I want to lean on Jan given that however you define the edge and I'd love to hear your views on what that even means, but um, the edge clearly has to be connected by fiber and Jan, you, you're the most fiber rich of, of the panelists given your uh, portfolio companies, whether it's fiber to the home or fiber to the data center, fiber to the enterprise um, across continents. So um, first of all, you, you, you know, you, you met, a lot of you have mentioned fiber to the home in the European context, but not so much US. Um, Jan, why, why is that? Um, and then secondly, what do you make of, of kind of edge compute and how does that kind of play within, within your investing framework? Yeah, I think, you know, there is a key difference between um, Europe and the US uh, if you look at, at fiber to the home build outs, uh, which is cable. You know, you don't have uh, basically cable as, as uh, present in many of the European markets, you know, taking, for example, Germany, uh, which we know well, or you know, Netherlands or, or, you know, Sweden. Cable is very much is focused on the tier one larger cities, um, but in the more rural areas there is no no cable. So what does that mean? You know, the many of the rural areas 
basically have only DSL today. You know, major markets like like Germany, um, you know, have less than 10% fiber penetration today um, across the country. So that has been a big, big opportunity. I think you know it's uh, taking it's taken a bit longer in the U.S. for people to get comfortable that that you're not going to have a single provider. Um, basically, you're going to have typically a balanced uh, position between a cable company and and um, uh, and a fiber company. I think people are getting getting there. You know, I mean, price points are a lot higher in the U.S. than in Europe, uh, so the economics are actually not that different um, at a lower penetration. Uh, and and uh, you know, I. Personally, um, you know, I think it's uh, one is on the good end with with owning a fiber business and competing against a cable company because you have a longer, a better, longer term sustainable technology. You, know, you can argue all day long if cable is sufficient. Uh, I wouldn't make huge assumptions that fiber to the home is going to take away all the the, the um, <coughs> all the market share from cable. Um, uh, but long term, it's the better end to be on. So. I think people are getting more comfortable with these investments in the US, you know, not everybody loves the consumer uh, dealing with consumers aspect, uh, obviously, of a business, I think having a, if you will, you know, uh, people in, in, in Europe are thinking about wholesale models where you own the infrastructure, but not the consumers, that is a lot more difficult if you don't have a single provider, um, as, uh, but, but basically a cable company as well. Uh, but it's not impossible, um, but, but uh, we haven't seen that happen in, in markets yet where you have several providers. So I think people are getting more um, comfortable with it in the US, uh, relying on a you know, low competition market with two parties rather than one party. Um, certainly we are getting, you know, we are relatively comfortable with it. Uh, we had, the reason we have spent more time on it in Europe than in the US is not really, it's more a, a kind of a time allocation than not liking the sector, you know, fiber penetration generally in the US is still, still very low. Uh, I mean, I'm here in the middle of Manhattan and, uh, there is no fiber fiber provider serving my building. Um, so <laughs> I'm stuck with cable, whether I like it or not. Um, and, uh, you know, that's uh, even more true in, uh, as you move out outside the major cities. So I think there, you know, personally, I think fiber uh, and the fiber to the, uh, on the residential side in particular is going to be, is already and will even more be considered a competitive advantage of, of a country almost, uh, you know, especially with more people working remotely. So there is already now, but I think there will be even more a push to build out fiber in most locations until it's really in the middle of completely nowhere um, um, in, 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 you know, in the mountains somewhere. So I think, uh, you know, it's actually attractive uh, both in the US and in Europe. I think it's, you know, the getting your head around the competitive situation in Europe in the rural markets is, is easier since, you know, <laughs> you have only four Mbit DSL in most markets that you compete with. But I think you know having one competitor uh, is still a very reasonable kind of uh, market situation, especially at the price points. And we haven't really seen any dramatic price pressure in these situations. I think that's the big concern: is there going to be a price uh, fight? So you know we haven't really seen that. So um, I think it, it'll become much more active in the U.S. Um, um, as well. Uh, and I think it's a very attractive market, especially the next five to 10 years. Uh, I'm convinced fiber will be built out almost everywhere. Um, to your second uh, question um, on the on the edge side, I mean, that's uh, obviously, in, there is no real, I mean, other than uh, Beth, uh, Beth's uh, business, there is very few businesses that focus on, you know, what people think about the edge, you know, the far edge being really on kind of mobile sites. Uh, there is not a proven business model, you know, we, we certainly are evaluating how to participate in that. But what people mean about edge is clearly at the moment more kind of, uh, you know, smaller type facilities uh, that are nearer to the end users uh, to distribute content or, you know, have to compute closer to, to end users. So for those, it's extremely important to be well connected, uh, you know, with uh, so business customers and residential customers can, can have access. Uh, we clearly will continue monitoring closely how to best participate in the far edge or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it is, there are not a lot of revenue models at the moment uh, yet. So uh, we're trying to stay ahead. We have the best name for sure to participate in that uh, business model with Edge Connects. Uh, I wouldn't say far edge is a big part of their business model uh, today, but, but it cer certainly should be going forward.
Uh, Jazz, do you think Far Edge is uh, a proven model with uh, huge opportunities or still a kind of TBD? TBD, in all fairness, but too interesting not to watch, too interesting not to put some money to work and try to figure that out. And so whether it's, Beth mentioned something earlier about private LTE, we're also really interested in private LTE. And one of Blackstone's, uh, I guess, unique footprints is that we have a lot of warehouses just as a function of our real estate group and thinking about how we can begin to experiment in that almost as a bit of a venture capital type play in terms of creating private LTE networks with some of our customers on the logistics side and how that might play into something. Um, we're really in a learning phase, to be honest. Um, so we're almost out of time. Um, I apologize, I wasn't able to get to all the questions that people have uh, kind of kind of asked. But um, I think the um, you know one one thing that uh, you all have in common is you know private portfolio companies competing against big global uh, globally active listed companies. And uh, how do you compete with the public companies other than on price uh, across these various sectors? Why don't we kind of start with Beth, Waldemar, Jazz, and then and then Jan if there's time. You know, it's interesting. I, I don't. Are you asking about competing with public companies in terms of assets we might invest in, or how our portfolio of companies Com commercially compete? with? Uh, yeah, how do you compete in the market for for business? You know, it's it's interesting. I, I would say we don't actually look at it often through that lens, unless that public company somehow has access to capital at a cheaper rate, either through securitization or otherwise that they can access capital cheaper. If if any, you know, if anything, in some ways public companies for right or wrong, uh, quarterly earnings and guidance matters uh, and they're navigating and having to handle a sort of diverse and, and increasingly vocal shareholder base. And so in some ways uh, we really appreciate the latitude and flexibility to really think about the long-term and about the investments we make in the business that really can go about generating longer term equity value and have the sort of benefit and, and flexibility not to think about near-term quarters or, or how that might look or, or present to certain shareholders uh, in the marketplace. Um, but when we think about competition, it's really, are we providing a valued service or solution to the end customer? And whether our competitors are, are public or, or private um, enters less into our thinking, I would say. Was I next, John? Okay. I, I'd say, I think it's not a perfect answer. We don't think about it that way. I think when competing for deals, that's obviously more difficult. I think in general, we try to, I think, seek complexity and sell simplicity. I think it's kind of trying to find value and create create value that way. Uh, so, you know, I think we try to stay away from, from auctions and others. And I, I mean, you know, when you're competing against a public company and I think increasingly as, as all of our fund sizes have increased, you end up competing more with, uh, you know, well-capitalized private public companies, right? But I think, as Beth alluded to, they're they're oftentimes, you know, divergent motives uh, and 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 sort of, you know, constituents that the management team has to has to, you know, uh, deal with, and and that makes them perhaps at times shorter-term oriented versus longer-term. And I think we have the benefit of of that duration of capital as well. I think we, we've, um, we've probably got two interesting examples, which is one with regard to our tower platform, Phoenix, which today has over 10,000 towers in 17 different markets from the US, France, Ireland to, to big chunks of South and Central America. We, we do compete against AMT and Celnex a lot. And it's hard. I mean, they're very good. And so I think the single best answer I have on that is speed and conviction. I mean, I think even it's, it's sort of M&A 101 for, for all of us on the phone today or on the Zoom, which is moving speed quickly, uh, expeditiously, and, uh, and, and really sort of driving your counterparties in a way that gets them what they want faster helps. And as you can imagine, if you're a $100 billion public company with lots of priorities, um, that, 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 you know, that might be a little bit slower in moving on something. So I think we, we certainly lose way more than we win, but we're focused on, on speed and conviction. In terms of our new deals that are outside of like our big platforms like Phoenix, um, we really love to find founders and entrepreneurs that want a partner that see a vision to building something and then selling it to a strategic three, four, five years down the road. Our only way to really win is to offer something different where our capital helps them level up and get to a place to sell. So when we invested in Sipartech in France, that's probably a business that you know might fit for a number of strategics, EU networks, others, et cetera. But finding a really terrific founder that is committed to building it and getting it to that next place was what distinguished us in that situation. 
I hope you meant Zeo there, but anyway. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think the only thing to add is that it's actually, uh, you know, as, as uh, Waldemar said, I think we can take a longer perspective uh, um, and, uh, you know, in the current generational shift that we're seeing in terms of digital infrastructure, I think that's an advantage. We don't focus on next quarter earnings. We focus on, uh, you know, five, six, seven, eight years down the road and uh, investments don't have to generate next quarter, quarter, uh, results, but uh, you know, it'd be very hard to build a new fiber business. Uh, you know, if you're hoping to have revenues uh, on it uh, next quarter, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't work that way. Um, I think uh, that's an advantage. The other advantage is that it's for our companies. It's actually faster, I think, to raise capital. Uh, you know, uh, than than if they were public. I mean, you know, we can uh, provide them with new capital that they need uh, in a matter of days. Um, uh, very quick decisions in the boards, you know, no big formality. So I think speed um, is a big advantage uh, in, for private companies. I don't look at it really as much public versus private, to be honest, as well. There are certain companies that, that are, you know, for now, I think the private markets are a better home for them. Um, uh, due to That's mostly due to the long-term focus and, and um, um, investments needed. Great, that was a great answer. Um, so we are into stoppage time. Jan, you had the last word. I'm gonna hand it back to Nicole uh, for any uh, sort of closing comments. And I wanna appreciate the panelists for, uh, for all their time. Yes, thanks, John. Yes, uh, on behalf of PTC, we do. We wanna say a big mahalo to everybody that was on the webinar today and of taking their time out of their busy schedules to participate. And then for those of you who are on watching as well, a recording of this webinar will be available 24 hours after. Um, it is completed this afternoon. We will send you an email with all of that information as well as a link to a survey. As you know, we love to hear your feedback on everything that PTC does. And don't forget, PTC 21, New Realities, January 17th through 20th, 2021. Visit our website, ptc.org slash ptc21. Mahalo and have a great day.